All right, so just a real quick review before we get into uh, where we're at tonight. So just a quick recap. Uh, we're going to hear about uh, Theophilus. So Theophilus means in Greek either friend of God or beloved of God. Uh, so the name could be a generic title to the people who are going to read the letter, uh, but probably not. Mo most likely, Theophilus was a real person, was the patron of Luke, uh, who paid to have uh, both Luke and Acts published uh, in the church. Most likely, he was a God-fearer, so someone that uh, began as a Gentile follower of Judaism, the worship of the true God, and then converted to uh, following Christ. And the reason Luke uh, wrote his gospel and wrote Acts is to provide eyewitness accounts to Theophilus and then, of course, the church uh, of the life of Christ and then the doings of his apostles uh, in the early church, particularly Peter, John, Paul, and James, the brother of Jesus, and Stephen. And then for the dating, um, dating for this book ranges from the late first century uh, back to about 60 AD. Uh, the conservative dating is also the more popular dating of around 60 uh, before the destruction of the temple in 70 uh, because it does not include the destruction of the temple, neither does it talk about the execution of Paul in Rome. It just stops before that. So most likely it was written before 70 AD. And its purpose, again, was to provide eyewitness accounts to all the events that it talks about. Okay, so to understand the audience of Acts and the themes of this book, uh, we have to know a little bit about what life was like in the first century. What was it like in the early church? So that's where we're going to start uh, tonight. Okay, Luke's ideal audience was probably on average of uh, a higher educational level than many others uh, who had a wide knowledge of the culture of the Aegean Greeks and as well as a familiarity <coughs> with the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures which at the time would have been the oldest, uh, the oldest documents of the Hebrew scriptures. Now you think, well, well, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Yeah, all that stuff was lost. They had the Septuagint was commissioned to have 70 copies of uh, a good, well, that was later, that was Constantine, I'm getting ahead of myself. They had, uh, they had the scriptures translated into Greek. That's what they read in synagogue. That's what they would have read uh, day to day. Uh, that's what Jesus is quoting when he quotes scriptures. It's from the Greek, not the Hebrew. You can tell that because you'll read um, Jesus or whoever is quoting the Old Testament in the New Testament, and you'll go look that passage up in your Old Testament, and they will not be the same. There's a reason for that, because they're quoting Septuagint, word for word. So if you look at the Greek New Testament and you look at the Greek Old Testament, it's word for word exactly the same uh, because they are not quoting the Hebrew. But our Old Testaments are translated from the Hebrew. <coughs> and the oldest, uh, until the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, the oldest manuscripts of the Old Testament were the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. That's what Jesus and the people in the first century had. Later, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls and like the Nag Hammadi uh, documents, now they have Hebrew scriptures that predate the Septuagint, and lo, lo and behold, they're pretty good translations. Yeah, the Jews were really, really good at copying scripture and copying it accurately. So those are authentic then? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls, absolutely. Yep. Now, there are a lot of fakes out there, but they're disreputable manuscript people selling stuff that, like the fiasco they had at the uh, Museum of the Bible, they found out most of their manuscripts were fake, which is not good, rather embarrassing. So anyway, so Luke's audience is going to be uh, a little more uptown than other audiences necessarily. Uh, 
and that observation probably also supports the likelihood that it was more a more economically stable area than say uh, a bunch of rural peasants uh, in Galilee or in Egypt um, that some of these people are going to be pretty well off uh, be better off than the average uh, artisan would have been and someone like Theophilus Theophilus, Theophilus a lot better off and that's an opinion of frequent scholarly opinion researching the background of this book. And the reason for that, that Luke's audience was wealthier and more highly educated on average uh, than that of the intended audience, original audiences of the other Gospels, is uh, pretty reasonable. Uh, first off, Luke dedicates his work to most excellent Theophilus, which is a title suggesting that Theophilus was probably a person of prestige and of, of rank in society. And although Theophilus is the explicit uh, narrati, the one the, it is written to, um, no ancient audience would automatically assume that, that because this is written to this person that it was just for them, or that it was uh, socially representative of the ideal audience of Luke. Uh, because one might dedicate a work to a person of higher rank than other clients who heard, remember, client patron relationships were big at this time. Um, the reason you would dedicate a work to someone of higher rank than uh, the other clients who heard the work read uh, at, for example, a banquet being put on by the patron, which we talked a little bit about last week. So, say, Theophilus would have thrown on a dinner party to read, have read out loud this work that he commissioned Luke to write. Uh, but nevertheless, by Luke addressing him as part of his audience, Luke is going to appeal to a person that has some status in society. And Luke also will emphasize that many people of status who follow the way or remember people who People who followed Christ back then called themselves followers of the way. So people following the way, uh, which you can see in various places in Luke and Acts, uh, they're going to be portrayed as uh, being a little bit higher status than the average person. And also one of the recurring themes in all the Gospels, actually, have been also Acts of not loving money. You don't, you don't preach not loving money to people that don't have any money, right? So yeah, tell us something we don't know, right? Okay, and then uh, Luke is also going to portray Paul's status as relatively high, uh, which, you know, is going to be interesting to anybody who's hearing it about wanting to know about Paul's background, but it's going to be especially of interest to someone else who has status in society. It's like, oh, I can relate to this guy because he comes from such and such stratum of society. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about Paul more later. Okay, so although Luke's gospel contains the most sweeping condemnation of the accumulation of wealth, you can see that in Luke 3.11, uh, Luke 12, Luke 14, his emphasis on the issue might suggest to us that the audience can afford to be challenged in that area of generosity. So, yeah, he's pre, you know, his message is going to be one of you know, condemnation of the accumulation of wealth because these people will be receptive to that kind of criticism. And also, uh, an educated audience is going to be the best to appreciate uh, the elements of classical rhetoric uh, alongside all of the stylistic variations uh, used for different settings in the writing. So, like Luke's Gospel is written in a style of a Homeric epic, 
All right, so everybody, everybody's status in their education is going to have read Homer. They are going to know the Iliad and the Odyssey, which a lot of you probably had to read the Odyssey in school. Or you saw the movie, Well, Brother, Where Art Thou, which is based on, the, based on the poem. So people with a classical education and a, and a training in rhetoric are going to appreciate the style that Luke is using. So Luke uses this, this epic style of writing, big, formal Greek, beautiful Greek, uh, to tell the story of Christ. Uh, so he's going to portray him like a hero of old because people of status and learning love that stuff. And especially the people he's writing to, he's writing in that style because that is the style that they love because that is what good literature is. And Luke is, you know, the greatest story ever told is great literature. So that is the way he wrote it. So each gospel writer had their own personal nuances that they put into the writing. And in Luke's case, epic hero, right? And the same with Acts. He's going to have these same rhetorical devices, especially because of all the speeches. There's going to be a great oration. You know, this would have been a wonderful thing to listen to out loud for someone who is educated and appreciates the subtlety of the language. They're going to pick up on all this stuff because that's what people did for fun back then. There was no TV. There was no you know, reality shows. This was not only church, also entertainment. This is what people did for enjoyment. Okay, now you'll see other documents which are extra biblical. Uh, I'll use the infancy gospel of Thomas, for example, one of the false gospels. So the infancy gospel of Thomas talks about Jesus refusing to learn the Greek alphabet, right? Which Jesus refused to learn something, right? I mean, he had to learn just like we did. So in this infancy got narrative, which was pop, a popular dreck that was written to entertain somebody. It's like, oh yeah, here's this parody of this Jesus character. Oh yeah, he didn't want to learn Greek either. No, neither do we, because we don't value that, right? That's the audience that these false gospels were, were pointed to, as opposed to in Luke, where Jesus reads scripture aloud, where Paul quotes Greek poets. Uh, where it talks about Paul's special academic training. Uh, for example, Paul was schooled in the best schools of Rome all right, and Jerusalem. He was trained to be a scribe. A scribe, which, oddly enough, we're going to talk about this in the sermon Sunday because the scribes are there. But scribes, in the beginning, in the before time, a scribe was exactly what it sounded like. They were somebody who was trained to be a copyist to make a copy of a document quickly and accurately. Uh, it no longer means that in New Testament times. By this time, the word scribe, capital S, means a doctor of the law and not a doctor of an attorney, doctor of the law of God, which means the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. In umbrella terms, it's always called the law, the Hebrew scriptures. Okay, so... Paul was trained in the best schools of Jerusalem and Rome to be a Pharisee of Pharisees, as he called himself, the ruling party within Judaism. All right, so he was trained to be a fantastic doctor of the law at the highest level. So he would be equivalent to like Nicodemus or Caiaphas. All these guys are at the top, top of the food chain in Judaism. Okay, so they're going to appreciate, this audience is going to appreciate what Paul brings to the table rhetorically. At the same time, we should not press the connection with Theophilus or other elite members of society who were converts in the early church and push that too far because Theophilus is of considerable status, obviously, or he couldn't commission this. And Luke emphasizes the high status of many characters in the narration but that doesn't mean that Luke's audience is entirely or mostly of high status. This is all just background stuff. So it's not like, oh, this gospel is written for the you know, 1%. No, you know, it's written for everybody. But the style and the appeal was done in those days to be able to catch the attention of the wealthy, to be able to afford to disseminate this work to the greater church uh, because it takes money to do everything. 
right? We have that even today. Uh, so even back then, they didn't just, oh, hey, we're going to make copies of this and send it to all the churches. They still had to pay for it. They still had to obtain materials. They still had to have scribes that could take high-speed dictation and do it accurately and so on. Okay, but the reason we dwell on it a little bit is because rank and status were crucial issues in Mediterranean society. We have uh, epitaphs, you know, etched in stone, written in books uh, that suggest that those of lower rank would still celebrate their status within their group of peers, but some scholars have found that there is a marked feeling of inferiority and a pathetic desire for self-assertion. So even back then, people's egos got bruised, and they did things to make themselves feel better, and one of the ways rich people make themselves feel better is get their name put on something, right? Okay, social mobility in those days was even more uncommon than it is today. You know, unfortunately today, the rich stay rich and the poor tend to stay poor. Social mobility of any kind was unheard of in, the, in those days, uh, except for people who were freed from slavery would get a you know, quick uptick in their social standing. Uh, and people who were newly wealthy, new money, merchants in the cities, uh, people who the patricians of the Roman Empire would look down their nose at because people who make their money by trade are contemptible. How dare you make money like that? The only kind of money is old money from land and things of that nature, owning a mine where you get gold and silver, not conducting trade. That is, ugh, how dare you? until those guys all of a sudden get to become senators and shake everything up. Which happened in the previous century to where we are today in uh, the first century in this area. Okay, so Luke is going to portray Paul in Acts with images drawn from popular philosophy, from popular rhetoric. Uh, a lot of these things inform his style of writing. Uh, and, and it's all there for us to see. Although, in practice, different members of the actual audience hearing this would have caught those nuances with varying levels of accuracy. Okay, so not everybody is going to catch everything. You know, it's kind of like when they make a Disney movie. You know, the obvious jokes are there for the kids, but there are adult <laughs> jokes that the kids don't notice until later, but the parents catch because it keeps the parents engaged because they had to be drugged to the theater for their kid to see Frozen 18, you know, 20 times. Uh, so they did that. They have that same kind of thing. Uh, his ideal audience, however, would have caught all of this stuff. And you might think, well, that's a lot to ask of, of a group of people listening to the thing because that's foreign to us today. We don't listen to, we don't read a book like that. And we certainly don't have books read to us. And then like you dwell on, oh, yes, this was a great turn of phrase. You know, it's just, we don't do that. We don't appreciate it like they would have. Which is probably why Bible study is so hard for us sometimes, because we don't get the illusions. Uh, we don't get the references. Uh, on top of not knowing the Old Testament like we should, all this other stuff, all these allusions to popular culture in the first century, we're not going to get it. You know, it's like someone coming here from Eastern Europe and we expect them to get all the pop culture references that teenagers spout off every two seconds. They're lost. They have no idea what they're talking about. They're like, it's English. I know the words, but I have no idea what they mean. Okay. It doesn't have to be from Eastern Europe. No, it doesn't. Okay, so Luke's ideal audience appears to be urban, Greek, perhaps in an officially Romanized city, such as Corinth or Philippi, and they would be familiar with some measure of education, some kind of formal education, and with public oration. They would be familiar with the Jewish religion, and at least through banquet lecturers, as we talked about last week, and philosophic orators who get up and just for... That's their trade. They, they get up and they, they read the stuff. 
they would be familiar with some philosophical ideas, some Greek philosophical ideas, a lot of stuff which we are not familiar with today unless you take a class in philosophy. Even if they didn't have that formal training, uh, rhetorical techniques tended to filter down to urban audiences who were accustomed to hearing speeches. And again, remember, there's no television. There's theater, there's no television, there's no radio. If you want to be entertained, you go down to the Forum in Rome or wherever, whatever city you're in, you would go down to the urban center and you would listen to people talk, listen to people give speeches, uh, listen to people give legal speeches, listen to them orate the news, orate philosophy, what have you. So the question as to whether Luke's audience is largely Jewish or largely Gentile, which a lot of people want to make much of, uh, is in one way uh, kind of a forced issue. Uh, by this period, the Greek churches included a sizable number of Gentiles. Okay, So Philippi never had a large Jewish population to begin with. You'll see that in, Luke, uh, in uh, Acts 16. But at the same time, a lot of these churches grew out of synagogues. And you'll see that in Acts 17, Acts 18, Acts 19. Or uh, even in Acts uh, 16, that they grew out of Jewish prayer groups. Uh, so they would include a sizable number of Jewish people and also Gentile synagogue goers who would have necessarily constituted the initial teaching nucleus of that congregation. Excuse me. So to the extent that one can define broadly what the audience of Luke was, the idea of the God fear might be the most central one, and that was certainly central in Luke's gospel as well. So again, a God fearer is a Greek, a Gentile, who saw what was going on with the Jewish God as opposed to all these pagan gods and said, that's the true God. I want to follow that. They don't necessarily become Jews, but they were God fearers. They believed in that God. They didn't go the full way and become Jews, but they came and worshiped at the temple. They uh, maybe did not participate in the sacrificial system, but they prayed to the God of Israel. And then God fears, many of which became Christians, converted to Christianity. All right, so a summary of what the ideal readers or hearers of Luke and Acts would be, would be they're well-educated, they're basically familiar with Eastern Mediterranean geography and more familiar with the better known provinces of that area. And if you don't think that's a big deal, go ask a teenager to start pointing countries on a map. They can't. They don't know. They can barely point out the 50 states. So this audience, they broadly know the major provinces of the empire. Uh, Luke could expect them to know only Greek. And that goes for the Jews as well. A lot of the Jews could not read, could not speak Hebrew outside of Jerusalem, outside of Israel. That was not unusual. And you'll see that because Luke uses Greek titles for coins, uh, which also infers that this is probably a diaspora, diaspora, argue about how to say that. So the diaspora, the diaspora, that is... The Jews used to be all in Israel, and then psh, between centuries and centuries of war and capture and being enslaved and being freed, they're all over the place, uh, and their synagogues all over the place. So they are part of the dispersion, right? The, all the Jews used to be here, and now they're here. That is the dispersion, the diaspora. Um, this audience is also attracted to Judaism, which they're God fears. That would make sense. They know a lot. They know the Septuagint. They know the Hebrew scriptures in Greek. And they know a lot about Judaism, but they know a little about some things, but not everything. Okay? They know a lot about pagan religions, 
because they're surrounded by it. That's where they came from. So they know a lot about pagan religions, and they're put off by it, which is why they became God-fearers and became Christians. Okay, according to probably the foremost commentator on the book of Acts, a guy named Keener, says that Luke assumes an audience in which Gentiles are numerically predominant, as we might expect to be the eventual case with the churches in the Pauline missions that he depicts. So I'll say that again. Luke assumes an audience in which most of the people are Gentiles, Gentile converts of one kind or another. And you would expect that to be that way because look at the churches to which Paul goes on his missionary journeys. Okay, the foundation of the churches is Jewish. His ideal audience is conversant with the scriptures. Their knowledge of Judaism encompasses not Palestinian Judaism, although they're aware of some of it, uh, such as difference between Pharisees and Sadducees, they would understand. But they're a biblically-based diaspora Judaism. So this is a Judaism outside of Jerusalem. They know the Bible far better than they know post-biblical Jewish traditions, and that's kind of important. Okay, So they understand Judaism as it's contained in the scriptures. They don't understand everything that came after. So we're talking about what comes after the Old Testament, the stuff between the Testaments, like the Maccabean kings that you can read about in the Apocrypha. Uh, a lot of that stuff, they're not familiar with that. They know the Jews of the Old Testament and where they're at today. And then Luke is also, and this is kind of a subtlety, but Luke is a, at least a little familiar with the traditional Hellenistic Hellenistic just means a synonym for Greek. Traditional Hellenistic Jewish apologetics. Okay, that was a mouthful. So apologetics is defending the faith. How to reason for what you believe based on facts. Okay, Hellenistic Jewish audience. That's a dispersion Judaism. Luke is familiar with the arguments used to defend the faith. Although all of these churches, and now we're talking Christian churches, although all these churches' foundations are Jewish, they also know the larger Greco-Roman culture. And they don't know it with the sense of being a minority, of being a second-class resident alien. These guys are, this is their culture. They are familiar with Greco-Roman culture. So even though the church's foundation is Jewish, they are culturally Greco-Roman. Uh, by nature, because that's what they are. So they're not adopting it as their own, that's what they are. Okay, there's some geographic assumptions made by Luke. Luke's gospel begins and ends in Jerusalem. Okay, it begins in Jerusalem. Where? Anybody remember where Luke starts? Oh, are you talking about the Pentecost or... Luke, the Gospel, not Book of Acts. Oh, sorry. Luke, where Luke's, the, book the, the, Luke book, the where the Book of Luke starts starts in Jerusalem. Where? Anybody remember? Well, it says John the Baptist, but Simeon. No, I'm sorry, Tell me. Um, oh, Zach John, Zachariah. Zechariah. Right? Zechariah, the angel comes to Zechariah in the temple. Okay, so Luke starts in the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, and it ends in Jerusalem. And what happens at the end of Luke? It's the last thing that happens in Luke. The ascension, the ascension, the ascension which is also which is also one of the first things that happens in Acts. Hmm. Okay, so Acts begins in Jerusalem with the ascension, but it ends in Rome. 
And that's important because the whole purpose of Luke's gospel is to tell the story of Christ from Jerusalem back to Jerusalem. And then it reorients because Luke is about the mission of Christ, what Christ did in his ministry on earth and the story of our salvation. Acts tells us about the birth of the church and a change in mission beginning in and a change in strategy. Okay, a transformation of the historical geographic orientation, if you wish. Uh, in previous salvation history, it was centered around Jerusalem. It was centered around the Jews. And now it is going to be centered around Great the, the greater world, the Great Commission, which is going to begin in Jerusalem, and then we'll see it end in Rome, but it's not an ending. It's a, this is what happens next. Uh, to the ends of the earth, you could say the ends of the earth are Rome because all roads read from Rome as well as to Rome. Rome was the center of the world at that time. Okay, so the focus is going to relocate from the heart of salvation history to the heart of an empire, from the center of the world for the Jewish people to the center of the world for the Gentiles. And then it's going to change focus from heritage to mission, because the Jews are all about heritage, right? It's, we are the people of God. That's our birthright, right? They're still that way today. Yes. Mm-hmm. And now it's mission focused. It's focused outward. Okay, and then this Keener fellow wrote this, and I just copied it down because it's pretty good. So he says, our knowledge of Luke's real audience is limited and conclusions must be tentative. No kidding. Scholars have offered reasonable cases for various positions. I have attempted merely to offer the best reconstruction I can. Probably Luke's ideal audience consists of a mixed but predominantly Gentile congregation. Although he welcomes other listeners, his target audience seems to be Aegean, especially uh, Roman colonies with strong Pauline churches like Corinth and Philippi. And then recall that Paul's first, Paul's epistles were the first part of the New Testament written. Okay? So before the Gospels were written and published and read in church, Paul's letters are circulating. Okay? That was the first part of the New Testament to get written down. Um, And of those, the author, Luke, has the most direct personal knowledge of the church in Philippi. uh, Because we're going to hear about Luke following Paul around. Right? So his audience is acutely aware of the larger Roman Empire and the developing attitudes toward the Christian movement. So negative public views toward their executed founder, Paul, constitute a matter of shame, perhaps especially in the Roman colony of Philippi, but elsewhere as all, which invites Luke's apologetic, Luke's Luke's defense of the faith. Because here's Paul, he's a big deal guy, right? And well, you know, he was executed too. And for shame, all the leaders of this church wind up getting killed, but, you know, Jesus didn't stay dead, which is fairly important. So, and we will hear Paul preach about that. That's the end of all the background stuff, which is a lot. I know some of it's not terribly interesting. I think most of the stuff from last week is interesting. But the idea of audiences for biblical documents is important because... When we interpret the Bible, we have to remember that what it means for us has to mean what it meant for the people to whom it was originally written. They cannot, it can't change. The meaning of the Bible can't change over time as people change. So the audience that first heard Acts read, what it means to them, what it actually means, has to mean the same to them as it does to us. And it's easier for us to understand what it means if we understand who these people were, what their world was like. Um, All of that stuff is important. Okay. And we'll...
we'll start on chapter one. I've got some questions for you guys to keep in mind as we go through chapters one and two. What was Jesus' last instructions to his apostles? Why was that command given last? What was the apostles' last question they asked Jesus? And why did they ask it? How many disciples gathered in Jerusalem? And how long were they there? And then I want you to imagine you were there. What was it like? Why was it important to replace Judas? And why do we never, ever hear about casting lots in the Bible ever again after they pick Matthias for fun? So just some random questions. All right, so let's make a beginning with Acts chapter 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the time or epochs when the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest areas of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons was there together, and said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his intestines gushed out. And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that field was called Hekeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate and no one dwell in it, and let another man take his office. Therefore, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles." Okay. Yeah, I'll oh. turn. It is getting a little showing. You're also right under the bed. Just preparing you for winter. Just preparing you for winter. I mean, yeah, that's a good Got all these different New King James versions. 
a different kind of Bible out there. <clears throat> and they all read different. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're a new Christian, how do you know which one is the one for you? Uh, if you're a new Christian and you don't ask anybody, you don't. I mean, because it's ridiculous how many there are. For example, the English Standard Version, uh, even the Catholics have a different Bible than the Protestants do. I mean, basically the Catholics have King James. And the, the Revised Standard Version is just King James modified. They have more books in their Bible than we do. Yeah, they still have the Apocrypha. <laughs> Fun fact, we still had the Apocrypha in our Bibles as Lutherans until such time as we started buying our Bibles from other people. And that happened when we came to this country. So even when we came to this country, our Bibles were still published in German for a long time. Uh, the last, the, la the latest, like youngest Luther Bible I have is from 1906, 1916, one or the other. It was published in Chicago. And it's in German. It's got the Apocrypha in it. And because we have always published our own Bibles. Always. When we came here, it became a, a good thing to buy our Bibles from other people. Because there weren't enough of us here to have a publishing house, publishing company to do that on our own. So we started buying our Bibles from, guess who? The other Protestants who threw all that stuff out a long time ago. Uh, which is why we don't have it in our Bibles anymore. Uh, there is a Lutheran study Bible edition of the Apocrypha. It's a separate volume, but you can buy it. It's got the study notes, just like the Lutheran study Bible does, uh, but it's the Apocrypha. Um, is it a bad thing to have? Absolutely not. Luther uh, no, said it's a good I, I, thing. I was going to say a, a Catholic Bible. I, you... I've got one. Okay. But I have a Bible problem. I've got all kinds of Bibles. <coughs> no. Uh, yeah, and having the Apocrypha in it is, you know, a good thing, too. You know, Luther didn't say, you know, oh, we need to throw these out. He just said they're not the same level as the rest of Scripture. And they're not. You, you can read them and see. Um, is it inspired Scripture? Eh, probably not. Um, are they good to read? Yeah, there's a lot of history in those books. You know, the world is run by the Greeks. And then in the New Testament, the world is run by the Romans. Where did the Romans come from? It's in the Apocrypha. It's in the books of Maccabees, the Maccabean kings and that, and that war. You find out where the Romans came from, uh, where Hanukkah came from. I mean, all that kind of good stuff is in there. Uh, there are books of wisdom, uh, the book of Ecclesiasticus and the book of Jesus, son of Sirach, also just called Sirach, um, which is a very large book. Uh, it's very good to read. And Lutheran pastors of the golden age of Orthodoxy in the 17th century wrote sermons about every chapter of Sirach. Uh, so absolutely we used to read them. When, when Luther said that they are not at the same level of scripture, but they are good to read, he didn't mean just good to read on your own. He meant to read in church, and he meant to preach about. Uh, nowadays, yeah, we don't know the rest of the Bible well enough that we, we should really start preaching from the Apocrypha. Nah, probably not. Not anytime soon. Then again, they also had sermons every day of the week. You know, every day they went to church and he'd get up there and preach about something. And a lot of those sermons would have been like that. Uh, so yeah, the Apocrypha is, is good to read. You know, and there's a lot of, I think there's some of my favorite stories and they are stories, uh, are like the missing parts of Daniel that were, there's parts of Daniel that are not in your Bible. Uh, that were part of the Apocrypha. And that would be the story like Bell and the Dragon, uh, which is a cool story. Uh, the Song of the Three Young Men, which is the prayer of the guys in the fiery furnace. We have that. That's in the Apocrypha. Uh, parts of the Old Greek Esther, not part of the Book of Esther, but they're in the Apocrypha, plus these histories. And like I said, there's some good wisdom books in there. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're valuable. They have their, their place to read. As far as picking a Bible translation, uh, I mean, why does Missouri Synod use the one they use? Because everybody uses ESV, to be honest. Because most mainstream, uh, pro most mainstream Christians in this country switch to the ESV. That's why. Is it more accurate? 
It is more accurate. It is a word-for-word -word literal translation, uh, and it's not bad. Um, I use, this is the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, which is an even stricter word-for-word -word liter literal translation. I think it's better. I also think it's easier to read out loud. You know, I can, I can read this out loud to you with no problem. ESV, which is what you hear in church, it, the, the word you think comes next doesn't come out of your mouth. It, it's just, it's hard to read publicly. Um, it's a good translation. It is a literal translation. It's not the best. Is it a newer one? Uh, it is newer. Because it wasn't King James Version pretty much the standard back in the day? Or? Yeah, and it still is for a lot of people. Um, I still read the 1688 version of the King James Bible, which is not your King James Bible. It's Middle English. It's Old English. It's weird. Um, so even your King James Bible is a translation. They cleaned it up from the original English. Uh, and it's good. It's archaic. Uh, but it has value. For example, if I say, you go down the road and carry only your knapsack, do not take a second tunic, etc. How many people did I just talk to? Did I tell you to go down the road or did I tell you all to go down the road? There's no distinction in modern English. In King James English, there is. That's why the these and thous and thys, that that's why you have those words because they make a difference between first and second person uh, personal pronouns. We don't have that in this language, so it's very vague. It, it's context. Am I talking to one person or two people? The only place where you have that in modern English is in the South. Because if I say y'all are crazy, it means I'm talking to you. And if I say all y'all are crazy, that means all y'all are crazy. Okay. In, in Southern English, there's still a distinction. But in, in everyday English, no, there's no distinction. So we've lost that subtlety. Uh, so the King James has value for that. And the New King James kind of retains that, and it's easier to read. They take out all the archaic stuff. Um, and it's, I, I have, there's seminary professors that that's all they read. They like it. It's fine. Now, when you do confirmation class, do you suggest to your confirmants a certain... I have the same conversation that I'm having with you. We, I, I lay it okay. on the line. I just wanted, because when yep. you're training these children, I just wondered if you want to stay consistent. That's why. Yeah, I mean, you do. I mean, they've grown up with the ESV. All these kids have grown up with the ESV in church. So that's what I use in class. Uh, and it, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, it's not the best translation, but it's pr it's pretty good. And it's nitpicky. When I say it's not the best, it's like I can nitpick all kinds of stuff. It's easy to understand, though, right? That's yeah, yeah, it's easy to read. I think an ASB is easier to read. And I also think it translates some stuff better. It's a personal preference. But I think it's a better overall translation. I think some of the choices are better. And the language is easier to read out loud. And I have to read out loud. So I like it because I can read it without stumbling and stuttering. ESV will catch me every time, especially if you grew up on King James, because some of that's still in your head. Like the Christmas story, I can, I can do it by memory from Luke 2, from King James. If I read ESV on Christmas Eve, I have to read very carefully because I know what comes next is not what comes next. But that's just growing up with different versions. Ver Bible version is personal, a very, very personal thing. Um, but I would say stick with a word for word. Literal translation is not going to steer you wrong, even if it's hard to read sometimes. Uh, and by that, I mean read out loud. Would, so that, would that mean then the ESV? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you're going like word for word, uh, word for word literal, you're looking at like at the far extreme, you'd be reading like the translations out of the Concordia Commentary series where each person that wrote the book did their own translation. It's word for word accurate. You can't read it because it's word for word accurate. It, it doesn't look like English. It's very, but the meaning comes across. Not, not ready for prime time reading, exactly. So you say word for word accurate meaning to the Hebrew? To the Hebrew and the Greek. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's extreme. And then you have things like the Amplified Bible. Very popular. To use it as a reference is great because it'll tell you the nuances of the Greek in parentheses. It'll say the word and it'll give you in parentheses other words that 
bring the nuance of S that Greek word out. That will yeah, it's like the other that. connotations that that word means because words have more than one meaning. Or, or like our only word for love, we only have one, and yet Greek is there four or five? Seven, Seven. altogether, actually. <laughs> anyway, so there's, that would help. There's only five in the Bible. Okay, five in the Bible. I just thought that was a good example. Yeah, that is a good example. So like the Amplified Bible will tell you which one they're talking about. Um, and that's good, but it, again, it's in parentheses. You're not going to read it. You know, you're not going to read, you know, love, brotherly, sacrificial love, your neighbor as yourself. It's because you can't, right? That's for reference. Then comes NASB. ESV, there's a graph somewhere that's got all this on it, but NASB. ESV, New King James, King James, on and on. And then you go to the other extreme. This is word for word accuracy. Over here is thought for thought accuracy, which is not accurate. That's your paraphrases. That's the Living Bible. Uh, the New English translation of the Bible, which I have one. In fact, when, I, when I'm working with the Bible on my computer, I have four translations open on, on uh, what is that? Bible Network, whatever it is, the Bible site I use. Uh, I have all of Greek, 1545 German, um, NASB, and usually the original King James, uh, because I like Luther's translation the best of all, because it's so plain spoken. And uh, if, you want an, if you want an example of an ideal Bible translation, it's Luther's translation of the Bible, because it is word for word, literal, and it's very easy to read if you read German. If you read mo early modern high German, it's easy to read. Uh, and it's very plain spoken. It's nothing pretentious about it. Uh, and even translating it into English, it comes across that way. It's just a it's great translation of the Bible, uh, which is probably why it's held up so well. You go to Germany, that's what you read in your Bible. It's Luther, period. That's what you get. Where does the NIV fall in there? NIV falls on the scope of literal, on the not as literal, and I do not like the NIV. And the reason I don't like the NIV, and I know everybody's got an NIV Bible, and I know everybody's it church. It's like a storybook. Yeah, and it's not a paraphrase. It, it's, the ESV is based on the NIV. They start. They don't start from scratch. They start from a translation, and then they work on it, going back to the original text. The NIV has a lot of problems. One of the problems being they can't leave it alone. They keep fiddling with it and fiddling with it, and that's where you get um, the gender pronouns being taken out and making it gender neutral and all that nonsense. That's just one of the things. I do not like the NIV. There is a lot of stuff in it that's just badly translated. And I could make you a list. I'm not doing it tonight. It's just I don't like the NIV. If you've used the NIV for years, keep using it. Use one translation and know it. If it comes up in Bible study and I have a problem with something, I will tell you. 99.9% .9 of the time, the average person is not going to get in trouble reading one of these. Okay? I mean, the NIV has been around for a long time. But you're going to notice things like that. It's like, oh, here's a new NIV. And you're like, what is this? Why is it? Yeah. I like the new hymnals when they change the words and they change the <laughs> melody or the. And if you saw their committees, they had. If you saw the committees they had for hymnals, you would shake your head and just go, well, "I'm glad that's not me." So I know I had a professor who's on the. He was one of the heads of the last hymnal, and he said, "Never again." And they're not done. I mean, they're still working on stuff for it. It's twenty years now. I can't imagine studying the Bible without a, a good commentary on right beside you yeah. or right, you know. I mean, it's like, it's, like, it's the Ethiopian eunuch. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, do you understand? Phillips asked him, do you understand what you're reading? Well, how can I understand unless someone teaches me? Because, mm -hmm. yeah, we have it, but... Mm. No, you, you have to go to the community. You have to go to the church. You know, not say... The extreme, like the Roman Catholic Church does it, we will tell you what it means. It's like, no. But you, you have to have a teacher to teach you what it means. If you do it on your own, you're going to get in trouble. You will get in trouble. Anybody's going to get in trouble interpreting anything on their own. If one person takes the U.S. Constitution on their own, 
they're going to come up with a cockamamie me meaning for a lot of stuff that is not what the founders intended, but they're off isolated on an island alone interpreting it, they're going to get in trouble. We do the same thing with the Bible, and that's far more important than the Constitution. So, yeah, NIV, you're on the literal, and you're squeezing down the, down the road towards center of NIV. I don't recommend it. I don't like it. There's other literal translations. Uh, they're there. Um, if you haven't heard of it, there's probably a reason. Then you have paraphrases, the living Bible. Ugh, it's a terrible translation. My mother loved that thing. It's a terrible <laughs> translation. It just, it, there's, there's no, they make it so easy to read that they lose the meaning. Mm -hmm. I mean, they act or change the meaning. It's not good. Uh, the new English translation is like that. But like I said, I always have that open because the text in that Bible is this big and all the reference stuff around it is like this. There's just a ton of stuff in it, which is really nice. The actual translation itself is, it's not, it's not good. Uh, the good news version. I have a copy of that. If I was going to read the Bible to a child, I would probably read that uh, because it's easy to read. It's easy to understand for a child to understand, but a child is not wrestling with doctrine. Okay, so it's okay. But as soon as they're old enough for meat and not milk, wean them onto something that's a little more solid. But one of those, it's like reading a story Bible. I mean, come on, that's not a translation, but it's a translation that a child can understand. You have to watch some of those. You yes, you do. Kids because yes, you do. They're not authentic. They put their own interjections in there that aren't true. Yeah, and we have fantastic children's Bibles from CPH. They, the ones they've done in recent years are fantastic. Uh, but you have Bibles like that. So if you want, if, if you want to give a Bible to a new Christian, and I have their head spin, uh, be use discretion and see where they're at, and if they can read a more or less literal translation, I would hand them an NASB. It's easy to read, and it it's, translates... Mm, I don't have too many problems with an NASB that I've ever run into. Uh, I would give them that. But if they are really, really new, I mean, they've never read the Bible in their life, give them something a little easier to read. I'd give them a paraphrase. I'd give them a, a more solid paraphrase. NIV ain't it. Um, or like the story is another really popular one, right? And they just paraphrase everything, and it's ugh. It's a quagmire of, of false teaching. Isn't that it's cross, supposed to be chronological? Yeah, yeah, it's a <coughs> chronological one, and it's also just para paraphrased to, it's not even the Bible anymore. It's more you're reading the screenplay of the Bible, essentially, okay? Uh, but it used to, use your discretion. But they're, the para paraphrases are not horrible. That's a lot of times when young, young children, after they're even confirmed, if they read scripture and don't understand it, they are turned off, yeah. basically. I mean, what I was handed when I was six years old was a Beck translation, which is, for better or worse, a Lutheran translation of all things. The New Testament Beck translation passed doctrinal approval. The Old Testament did not. Uh, because Dr. Beck was not a Hebrew scholar, and he cut some corners, and he screwed some stuff up. Because the Old Testament is not doctrinally pure. Uh, there's some problems with it. The New Testament is fantastic. It's dated. It sounds like 1970s English because it's 1970s English. It was you know, right around 1975 when he published it. And it was to be you know, in the American vernacular, and it is the American vernacular of the mid-70s. Uh, so it is not held up. It's very easy to read for a child, though. Uh, even the Old Testament. It's easy to read. And like I said, a kid's not getting bogged down in doctrine. So if you just want them to hit the major stories, that translation, you can still buy You can buy a, a Beck Bible for 20 bucks. There's only one place you can get them. Uh, it's the Christian News people uh, in Missouri. Uh, they still publish it, and that's really easy for a kid to read. Yeah. And it's not a paraphrase. It wasn't intended to be, but it's very easy to read, I think. Better than a paraphrase. But a paraphrase is fine for a kid. You know, I mean, you just have to, uh, you have to watch them. You know, we have to guide them. And a paraphrase will not last forever. Once you get beyond just knowing your Bible stories, and when you want to know the, all the prophecies that came true and all the things that were happening and all the people who are foreshadowing, you know, Christ, you can get them a real, literal translation. And then, you know, you got to work with them. 
You know, so Bible translations aren't easy. You know, if I would advise people, it's if whatever you have, if you like it, stick to it and read it, know it. And then you can learn what's wrong with it and work around it. There's nothing wrong with that. Annotate it. And it's like, okay, the translation has this, but it should be this. This is better. I do that all the time. Um, especially my ESV. I'll, I'll sit there and go, nah, that's not the best choice here. Um, but that's what you do. But no, it's not an easy, oh yeah, just get this. Yeah, There's no one size fits all, unfortunately. But again, literal, ESV, because that's what we use in church, NASB is better. <coughs> if you got to have a paraphrase, pick one. Pick one and stick with it. Uh, the Living Bible, again, is just awful. The good news is awful, but it's obviously awful. I mean, if you're, if you're a solid Christian and you give that to somebody and you read it with them, you can kind of steer what some of the stuff means that they're kind of soft pedaling a little bit. But to avoid all that problem, don't do paraphrases. But paraphrases are popular. I mean, they come up with new ones every year, every year. Once you get past Bible stories, even as a new Christian, once you get past Bible stories, get something that's more literal. Because then otherwise you're going to have doctrine problems down the road. Did that clarify at all? Because yeah. Well, I think that's one reason why there's not much youth in the churches anymore. Because a lot of, a lot of young people can't understand what they're reading, so they figure, why read it? You know whose fault that is? Parents. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, all of us. We've all done that. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, it's because we don't talk about it outside of church. Who talks about the Bible? <laughs> I mean, that's we've lost all that stuff. Yeah, that's like what we're talking about with these audience in Acts. You know, they're, they're going to hear this high, highfalutin Greek oration of all the stuff that the early church did. And they're going to appreciate all this subtext and context and, and rhetorical devices and allusions to popular culture and allusions to poets and whatever. And then quotes from the Hebrew Bible or from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And we're just sitting there going, duh, because <laughs> we don't get all of that. I mean, even when we have it pointed out to us, and I'll point some of it out to you, and I'm learning it at the same time you are. It's not like I know this stuff. It's like, okay, let's figure this stuff out. Let's see where these illusions are. It's like, yeah, I would have never known that unless it was pointed out. You know, it's just not obvious to us. But it has to mean the same thing to us as it did to them. So we have to do the work. The parallel Bible is interesting. Which uh, ones? Uh, don't ask me. Now, it, that, that it had um, NIV, King James, um, you know, being a king. Well, you, had to, you had to ask me that. Probably an ASP. <laughs> yeah. A lot of those, an yeah. ASP is the one they'll pick. But it, it was just, just interesting to just take a paragraph and just, oh, over here, this, what this, what this is. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, it's all right there. You don't, you know, you're not. Well, That's why I use Bible Gateway. Okay. You know, I, I have a free account yeah. on Bible Gateway. You can put like five yeah. translations yeah. side by side. So I just go point, 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 point. Yeah. And you know, that's why I do. And you can pick foreign language. So I've got Luther. I've got the original King James. I've got NET because of the notes. And then I've got NASB because that's my daily reader. And yeah, it's like wildly, sometimes wildly different. And a lot of times in King James, you will have phrases that aren't in any other translation because, because. Well, why? Because King James was written before a lot of the manuscript, I mean, think about when King James was written. So that's 18, 1860s, 17, 16, 16, 1680s. Try that again, 1680s. All right, so 1680s. Guess what they didn't have? They didn't have Dead Sea Scrolls. They didn't have Nag Hammadi. They didn't have any of these manuscript resources we have. So when they wrote that translation, all they had was the Masoretic text, you know, the received, the Textus Receptus, the same stuff Luther had do his translation. You know, so it's going to be a little different than the more current translations that take advantage of all the textual evidence. Um, which, oddly enough, Luther still agrees with, even though they discover new stuff. 
So and I, I lean toward the Luther translation. It ain't divinely inspired, but it's close. It is that close to being divinely inspired because every discovery they make, they don't change what Luther says. His translation holds up. Okay, he was definitely gifted. You know, he was definitely a genius and definitely inspired by the Holy Spirit. It may not be an inspired translation, but come on. <laughs> for 500 years, this translation's held up. There's a reason for that. All right, so, yeah. Well, I don't like it when they change the meanings of the words or they change the words. Yeah, like I don't. jealous and zealous. There's a big difference. There's a between big those. difference between them. Yeah. But well, they, they are used in the. They do. It, it was in the King James Version, they used zealous. In the newer Bibles, they changed it to jealous. I was jealous for the Lord. Oh, no, there's a big difference between I was zealous. For the Lord and I was jealous. Yeah, and then you have the arcane definition of jealous and the modern definition of jealous because, like you said, words, meanings change, unfortunately. And it's like, well, that's confusing. Yeah, as if it's not hard enough. So, yeah, Bible, Bible translations are a personal thing. People have very strong opinions of it, and we will go on about them at length. You should see guys at the seminary start arguing about that. It's ridiculous. You know, and I've got I've got one professor. He's still trying to lock in on a translation he wants, and he always goes back to New King James. He's like, can't beat it. He's like, well, you can't. I mean, New King James is great. You can't go wrong with that one. Um, so yeah. Do we want to stop there and talk about? Start talking about chapter one next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. That's what we'll do. Okay, so what was Jesus' last instructions to the apostles? Why was it given last? What was the apostles' last question? And why did they ask it? And how many of them were in Jerusalem and why that number? There actually is a reason. Numbers are important. Numbers are important, especially in the Bible. Numbers mean things. Well, sometimes they mean things. Most of the time they mean things. I don't, I don't think there's too many coincidences. No, numbers mean a lot to me, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. All right, well, so that's where we will leave it for this week.